Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We will uh, get started in just a couple of minutes here, so uh, bear with us. Welcome to anyone who's just joining us. We'll get started in just a minute or two. All right, I think we are ready to get started. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program, A Glimpse into Dinah's World, Revolutionary Black Philadelphia with speaker Adrian Whaley. Uh, my name is Dennis Pickrell, and I'm the executive director of Stenton, a museum property of the National Society of the Colonial Dames in Pennsylvania. And tonight's program is part of a series highlighting the life of Dinah as we build towards unveiling a memorial to her on April 20th, which it's hard to believe is, is just less than two months away at this point. Um, so before we get started with the program, I'd like to share a little bit about the context of this important project. Um, the genesis of the Dinah Memorial goes back to 2016 and 2017 when Stenton was uh, offered a memorial to James Logan that had been created for an annex building of the Library Company of Philadelphia in 1939. Now at that point, it had long since uh, been put into storage and was owned by the Association for Public Art. And when we received the offer, the national debate over monuments uh, especially regarding enslavers and who should be commemorated in our public spaces uh, was being hotly contested. The debate forced us to confront uh, another object that we stewarded uh, in our collection at Stenton, uh, which was a plaque that was erected in Dinah's honor in Stenton Park in 1912. And uh, this plaque was erected by the Colonial Dames and the Site and Relic Society of Germantown. Uh, the plaque, which had been removed from the park in the latter half of the 20th century, specifically commemorated uh, a nearly 200-year-old story about Stenton being saved from burning by the British during the Revolutionary War, which was later linked to Dinah, who was enslaved at Stenton but had gained her freedom by 1776. We decided as an organization that if we were going to accept the Logan Memorial and place it on Stenton's grounds, um, we also had to re-examine Dinah's story and think about how her life should be commemorated in the 21st century. So with this in mind, we applied to the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage and received a very generous grant in late 2018, which initiated this journey of exploring the history of Dinah's life and the community of enslaved and free laborers at Stenton, uh, which continues today. The project, which was called Inequality in Bronze, Monumental Plantation Legacies, involved working with our community, uh, especially our near neighbors uh, in Germantown, Logan, and Nicetown, which was an immensely rewarding experience for us all. We invited them to be a part of the decision-making process about what this new memorial should convey and embody about Dinah. Uh, and we also created a public forum to choose an artist to create the new monument, which uh, turned out to be Karen Olivier. Now, the saving story that is associated with Dinah has been well known in Germantown for decades. Um, but during our community meetings, it really elicited a, a range of responses. For some, it highlighted Dinah's tenacity and heroism while others questioned the veracity of a story that celebrated Dinah saving the home of an enslaver. Through new research and interpretation, our project has sought to reveal and commemorate the fullness of Dinah's life beyond just the saving story. There was so much more to her life that hadn't been shared previously. Uh, for instance, she almost certainly played a crucial role in reuniting her family at Stenton after being separated from her husband when she was enslaved by the Logan family. And she had agency in gaining her freedom and was buried at Stenton by her own request. 
In March 2020, the pandemic changed all our lives and disrupted the Dyna Pro Dyna Memorial Project as well, slowing our momentum with design and construction, which uh, was delayed over several years due to both COVID uh, and supply chain issues. But we've kept plugging away at it uh, all this time, and uh, I'm just so pleased to announce it, and we're really humbled and honored um, that Stenton will soon unveil the first memorial to an African-American woman from Philadelphia's history. So, yes, <laughs> worthy of applause. Um, so I sincerely hope that you'll all join us on April 20th uh, at 2 o'clock p.m. at Stenton for this uh, important celebration. Uh, you can register for the event at www.stenton.org slash programs, uh, which we're going to put into the chat. Uh, you can also learn more about Dyna and the project at www.stenton.org slash Dyna. And one other thing I should mention is that we have another program coming up, which is a Facebook Live program uh, on March 1st at 4 o'clock p.m. And that's a joint program with HSP. We'll really be delving into the archives and looking at the documentary evidence uh, about Dinah's uh, life. So I hope you'll join us then as well. So thank you everyone for being with us this evening. Uh, I'm now gonna turn it over to our community engagement coordinator, Stephanie Watts, who will introduce our speaker. Stephanie, over to you. Thanks, Dennis, and thanks to everyone that's attending. We are 80 people strong. This is really, really exciting. Um, you know, virtual programming kind of fell off once we got back outside. So really happy to have you all here with us tonight. Um, and I am beyond honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Adrian Whaley. Adrian is an educator and history lover who currently serves as the Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Museum of the American Revolution. Whaley earned her bachelor's degree in African-American studies from Harvard University and her master's in education from the University of Pennsylvania and previously served as curator of education and public programming at the African-American Museum in Philadelphia. She has worked in both art and history museums and loves the potential for objects, artifacts, and primary source documents to enrich student learning experiences. She carries her love of history and for uncovering the stories of, uh, of common people into her spare time as an avid genealogist researching her own family history. This then led Adrian to serve as the program chair and former president of the African American Genealogy Group. Adrian, we're so excited to have you and I am passing the mic to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you everybody for being here. I'm so excited to have this opportunity to share some information and some stories with you all. And hopefully we'll get into some really good conversation in the Q&A afterwards. Now, I want to give you a bit of a heads up that I am struggling through a cold right now. So you all have 100% of my brain, but you also might have a little bit of sniffles and sneezing and some coughing. So bear with me, we are gonna try to make it through this together. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. All right, so if maybe Stephanie wants to just give me a thumbs up and let me know that you can see the full screen. Is it looking I good to you? I can see the screen Perfect. and I can hear you. And just a quick note for anyone that has any questions, please uh, be sure to drop it in the Q&A box and not the comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we are gathered here together to talk a bit about Dinah's world. So essentially what is happening in Philadelphia, what's happening in the nation or what's gonna become the nation, what's happening in the lives of people of African descent over the course of Dinah's lifetime. Now, I have about 30 minutes to share information with you. So let me just tell you right off the bat, this is not a deep, deep, deep dive. You may not hear your favorite Black Philadelphian's name said out loud, out loud or the name of your favorite Black Philadelphia institution. That does not mean I don't love them. It just means I've got 30 minutes to cover some information to sort of give some brackets to the story of uh, Dinah's experience. So what are we going to talk about? So first, we're going to start with a bit of a timeline of Dinah's life, just so that we understand what it is that we're talking about. Then we're going to cover some demographics. Who is in Philadelphia? What is the proto-nation looking like at this point in time? We're then going to focus in on the period of the revolution, not just the war, but the overall revolutionary era. We're going to talk about turbulent times. We're going to talk about revolutionary ideals and some of the interesting things that are happening in and around Philadelphia and elsewhere in the colonies come states over, the, over that point in time. Then we're going to talk a bit about what happens after the war ends and some of the additional interesting stories that take place then. And then we're going to open it up for Q&A. And again, I'm going to 
breeze through some things. I'm going to move quickly. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. So what does Diana's timeline look like? Well, she's born around 1730. We don't know the exact date, but it's somewhere about that time. Around 1753, she's brought by the Logans to Stenton. In 1757, her husband is purchased by the Logans so that he can stay with his family as opposed to being sold away from them. Sometime before 1772, Dinah's daughter, Bess, is freed by the Logans. Then in 1776, Dinah herself is freed by the Logans. In 1776, her grandson, Cyrus, is also freed by the Logans. And then in 1805, Dinah passes away and she's buried in the garden at Stenton. So the time period that we're talking about here is really between 1730 and 1805. And you all probably all know timeline matters. So that means if you were thinking about a Black institution that's really later in the antebellum time period, we're probably not going to talk about it in this presentation because it probably hasn't been founded yet, right? So we're going to kind of look and see what the world does look like at this particular point in time. <clears throat> now, as I was thinking about Dinah's story and thinking in particular about these dates around 1730 to 1805, I started to brainstorm, like, who were some other people of African descent? whose dates are kind of similar to this, who might we think of in the revolutionary era, um, whose life might be kind of parallel to hers. And actually, someone came up as an almost perfect match. Benjamin Banneker, who is not in Philadelphia, he's down in Maryland, particularly in Baltimore, but he's born about 1731, and he dies around 1807. So when we think about Dinah's life and all of the things that we're exploring for her experiences, someone who is enslaved and then gets her freedom during the revolutionary period, compare that and think about just the broad diversity, the many different kinds of life experiences that people of African descent would have had at this point in time, because Benjamin Banneker, born free, astronomer, mathematician, working on almanacs, helping to survey Washington, D.C., vastly different experience from Dinah's, and yet hers is no less important than his. And each of them are part of the spectrum of African-American experience over the course of the revolutionary era. So it's very diverse. You're going to hear me say that a couple of times. So let's start a little bit with the demographics of Dinah's world. So in the early 1770s, there's approximately two and a half million people in British North America. Around 500,000 of those people are people of African descent. So that's about one out of every five people, right? That's 20%. Over 90% of those people of African descent are enslaved. So that is just a helpful thing to think about. But those folks are not distributed equally across British North America. So of those 500,000 people of African descent, about 200,000 of them just in Virginia, right? So we're gonna narrow this down a little bit so that we can better understand what Philadelphia looks like. And I'm gonna focus mostly on like the old city, downtown, close to the Delaware River part of Philadelphia, recognizing that uh, Dinah would have spent time probably in both areas, out in Germantown, as well as in sort of the, the center city area that we would think about today, particularly as the Logan family moved back and forth. So when we think about Philadelphia in the Revolutionary Era. This is essentially what we are talking about. So you can see at the bottom of this map is the Delaware River. You can see that there are uh, wharves and uh, docks and jetties and whatnot sort of poking out from the, the edge of the city's landmass. And if you take a look at these arrows, you can kind of get a sense of where these points are on a modern day landscape. So at the top, 8th and Market. Right. Picture that, especially if you're a commuter who ends up downtown, that very sparsely populated area, that's 8th and Market today. You can see Front and Vine Streets in the lower right-hand corner. You can see 6th and South, which looks basically barren on this map, right? This is what Philadelphia looks like at the beginning in the middle of the revolutionary era. It's going to grow. It's going to get bigger. It's going to expand. It's going to get much more populated and even more densely populated. But this is kind of what we're talking about in the early 1770s, mid-1770s. This gives you a sense of what some of the areas outside of the city, outside of that most densely populated area would have looked like. This is a view that shows the almshouse 
and Pennsylvania Hospital and the House of Employment that are outside of the city of Philadelphia at that point in time. Look at the animals, look at the landscape, look at how open that is. So all you have to do is walk a couple of blocks away from Market Street and you start to see vistas like this one. This is an image of the Schuylkill River and then looking over to Gray's Ferry. You can see that there's a pontoon bridge. So basically the bridge structure is um, up on flotation devices. And on the right-hand side of the bridge, you can sort of see that there's a rope. It's the guide for a rope pull ferry, literally a rope pull ferry. This is one of the ways that people cross the Schuylkill River to get over to Gray's Ferry in West Philadelphia during the time of Dinah's lifetime. Some of the houses are gonna look like these on Elfrith's Alley. Now, would they always have been this well-maintained? Possibly not. There are all different kinds of people who are living in what's now Old City Philadelphia, right? They have all different um, skill sets. They have all different uh, incomes and means for making money. And while this is a beautiful vista for us today, it could have looked a lot different back then, depending on who is living where and what's happening at any given point in time. Some of the houses are going to look like this, right? I believe this is one of the Shippen households, and this is like a mansion, essentially. And then some folks are essentially going to be living in slums, in back alleys, in buildings that are falling apart, that are not well maintained. There's a lot of that, especially close to the Delaware River. It's sort of where the quote unquote undesirables of society would have lived. And Philadelphia has all of that from the lower sorts to the middling classes to the upper class. When we think about Philadelphia and those sorts of houses we saw and the landscapes we saw, in the early 1770s, there's around 33 to 34,000 people living in Philadelphia. Of them, approximately 1,000 are enslaved. It's a super tiny percentage, right? That's about 3%. They're actually, um, what is it, more Dutch people, I want to say, still living in Philadelphia at this point in time than there are people of African descent who are enslaved. And then there's an even smaller number of free people of African descent, somewhere between three and 400. Now, again, those numbers are going to grow. So by 1776, there's around 700 or more free people of African descent. By 1790, we're looking at almost 2,000 free people of African descent. By 1800, we're almost at 6,500 free people of African descent. There are lots of reasons why this is happening. Everything from the Haitian Revolution, sending uh, lots of folks into Philadelphia, including uh, free and enslaved people of African descent. Uh, we're thinking about the Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery that's passed in 1780. I will come back to that a little bit later on. There are lots of people of African descent who are in Philadelphia at this point in time, the 1790s, 1800s, who were not born in Philadelphia, but have self-emancipated themselves um, and are coming from places like Delaware and Maryland, and they're swelling the population of the city of Philadelphia. So as Dinah comes in and out, she's going to be meeting all of these different people. She's going to be hearing different accents from different parts of the colonies come state. She's going to be having all sorts of interesting experiences as she moves around. And that's going to be true even beyond the population of people of African descent. All of the images that you see on the screen are people who would have been living in Philadelphia during Dinah's lifetime or representations of sort of general kinds of people who would have been living in the city. About 33% of Pennsylvania's population in the 1770s is German speaking. It's only around 20 something percent of folks who identify as English. You've got people who are Quaker, you've got people who were Jewish, you've got people who were Anabaptist, you've got people who are Methodist, you've got people who are Anglican, you've got people practicing many different kinds of faiths, speaking all different sorts of languages, they're working in all different sorts of jobs and careers, they're everywhere on the social and political ladder, um, they are super, super diverse. That is probably, like, I cannot emphasize that enough, I'd say, Philadelphia is the largest city, the most populated city in British North America. It's bigger than New York. It's bigger than Boston. So despite what Hamilton the musical says, Philly is actually where most of the rooms where it happened were. The only city that was significantly larger than it was London with 750,000 people at about this point in time. So, Lots is happening in Philadelphia. It is a center for many different kinds of things. 
What that means is that there are lots of people of African descent who want to be in Philadelphia. So for example, if you look at these two runaway notices for people who self-emancipated, the one on the left is from 1774, the one on the right is from 1803, you can see starting with the one for Charles City, January 3rd, 1774, run away from the subscriber, a Negro man named Sharper, about five feet, seven inches high, pitted with the smallpox. One of his four teeth is much decayed and he has a down look. As he can write, he may have forged himself a pass and I imagine, will endeavor to get to Philadelphia, right? $25 reward, ran away from the subscriber on the seventh instant at Stephenburg, Virginia, a Negro boy named Jack, about 15 years old, stout maid, had on when he went away, great description, et cetera, et cetera. He was raised in Dorchester County in the state of Maryland, from whence he once ran away and attempted to get to Philadelphia. So Philly is a place that people want to be. But Philadelphia is not a perfect place for people of African descent or for anybody, really. So the image on the right is a photograph, much, much later on from the Revolutionary Era, but of the London Coffee House, which is situated right down or was situated right down by the Delaware River. And you can see this advertisement from 1760 from the Pennsylvania Gazette. A likely Negro wench that can cook and wash and has had the smallpox to be sold at public vendue at the London Coffee House on Saturday, the 20th instant at 12 o'clock. So people might want to come to Philadelphia, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Philadelphia is going to give people of African descent the best kind of life. It's complicated, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A. <laughs> Excuse me. So what are people of African descent up to when they're in Philadelphia? And it's almost regardless of whether they're free or enslaved, except for some of the sort of... Um, higher tier, we'll say, um, occupations, but they're, especially during the war, are soldiers and sailors and privateers and laborers for the army. You've got sawyers who are working on um, like uh, cutting up logs and things like that for lumber and construction. You've got chimney sweeps, bricklayers, grave diggers. We're going to circle back to a story about graves and cemeteries. So hold on to a thought. You've got general laborers of all different types. You've got street vendors like the pepper pot soup lady that you can see in this picture on the left-hand side. You've got shop assistants for all different kinds of stores. And again, Philly is such a metropolitan city that you can get tons of stuff in the city. People of African descent are helping to stock those stores, are helping with customers, are helping with the manual labor for those shops. In private homes, you've got household servants, whether it's women who are serving as ladies' maids and helping to be nurses for children or laundresses or all sorts of things like that, or whether it's men who are serving as butlers or helping as uh, hostlers and you know, all sorts of things in households, large and small. Barbers, musicians, sailmakers, bakers, hostlers, teachers, and more, especially as time goes on and more um, of the world opens up for people of African descent, including here in Philadelphia. They're doing other things as well because work is a piece of people's lives but it is not the only piece of their lives. So I love these quotes from historian John Fanning Watson. This is from the 1830 publication of his called Annals of Philadelphia. And it says, it was the custom for slave blacks at the time of fairs and other great holidays to go to there, to this location that you can see on the left-hand side. This is Washington Square, right? So they're going there at the time of fairs and other great holidays to the number of 1,000 of both sexes and hold their dances, dancing after the manner of their several nations in Africa and speaking and singing in their native dialects, thus cheerily amusing themselves over the sleeping dust below. Then an aged lady, Mrs. H.S., has told me she has often seen the Guinea Negroes in the days of her youth going to the graves of their friends early in the morning and they're leaving them victuals and rum. So what are they doing? They're demonstrating cultural retentions. These are folks who maybe just got to Philadelphia, just got to what's gonna become the United States, or maybe they're folks who've been there for three or four generations but they are remembering languages that their families or they spoke back in Africa. They're remembering dances and cultural movements. They're remembering all sorts of things. They're honoring their dead. They're pouring libations. So this community that Diana would have been a part of, they're folks who came from somewhere. They came from people. 
they have historical knowledge of who they were. And it seems, at least in some cases, they're carrying that forward, right? They're trying to hold on to it, which makes me wonder, what was Dinah trying to hold on to? What are the stories that she might have been working to pass down? What are the songs that she might have known? What did she teach Bess? What did she teach Cyrus? Right? What is the, the culture that she maintained, that she held on to? So let's dig into turbulent times and revolutionary ideals. Because something big happens during Diana's lifetime. I mean, frankly, several big things happen. We're going to focus on the Revolutionary War era, but she was alive during the French and Indian War, right? Between the 1750s and the 1760s. She was alive for things before that. Lots is happening in the colonies and the early nation. But let's focus on the Revolution and the Revolutionary War. I'm going to do the world's quickest flyby of the revolutionary resistance movement and the war itself. You're gonna be like, where's the Boston massacre? I didn't put it in here. Where's the Boston Tea Party? I didn't put it in here. I'm starting with December of 1773. There is a tea party in Philadelphia. Now, it's not the same as the Boston Tea Party. They're not climbing onto ships. They're not dumping things overboard. Actually, what happens is people put up a bunch of broadsides all across that like old city part of Philadelphia that we were just looking at a map of. And they basically tell the captains of seven, I believe it is, ships that are sailing up the Delaware River, you can show up to Philadelphia, but you cannot unload the tea that you are carrying on board your ships. Well, the first captain of the first ship, he gets up to Philadelphia. He sees all of these broadsides posted around the city that are addressing him by name. And he decides this is not a great place to try to execute his plans to unload that tea. So he turns around and sails back down the Delaware. The other six ships turn around and sail back down the Delaware. And that is the Philadelphia Tea Party. Maybe a little less um, movie worthy, but definitely interesting. And I can imagine the fear he might have felt. So what happens next? Fall of 74, First Continental Congress meets at Carpenter's Hall here in Philadelphia. Then Massachusetts in April of 1775, the Battles of Lexington and Concord. Then in Philly, May of 1775, the Continental Congress reconvenes at Pennsylvania Hall, which is now Independence State House. Um, yeah, the uh, Independence Hall. Um, July of 1776, I think we all know what happens then. Independence is voted upon here in Philadelphia. The Declaration of Independence, which has been drafted here in Philadelphia, is voted on. It's approved. What next? Winter of 1776 to 1777. Well, I think we maybe have all heard of Washington's Crossing, right? Americans prevent the British from taking Philadelphia. Instead, they get the British to sort of backtrack and try to pursue some other plans. But that doesn't last for very long because in September of 1777, so much later in that same year, there's the Battle of Brandywine. The British have decided they're going to come to Philadelphia. They're going to take it over. And they defeat the Continental Army. They're able to come into the city. And all the way through June of 1778, they're able to occupy Philadelphia. The Continental Army, meanwhile, encamps outside of the city at Valley Forge. And so we know, there's a lot of Germantown folks, right? The Battle of the Germantown in October of 1777. I'm skipping ahead a bit. September of 1781, the Continental Army, including the Rhode Island Regiment, which has both Black and Native American soldiers in it, marches through Philadelphia towards Yorktown. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. October of 1781, siege of Yorktown. September of 1783, Treaty of Paris assigned, officially ending the war. So you can see there's a lot of Philadelphia in here. I wanted to kind of focus in on that so that we can think about what did Dinah see? What did Dinah hear? What did Dinah know was happening? What are the conversations that she was a part of? What was she afraid of? What was she excited about? What was her community buzzing about in all of the different ways that she had community? Because all of these things would have been on Dinah's radar, right? Other stuff is happening as well. You've got the war. The war is like dominating conversations in so many ways. Other things are happening. So for example, in 1772, there is an enslaved African man who is in England with his owner. And his owner tries to get him to go back on a boat so that he can head back to the place where he is normally enslaved. And that man, James Somerset says, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna go back to that place where I am enslaved when I've experienced what feels like freedom in England. He goes to court and he wins. And a lot of people actually interpret that, especially some really excited people of African descent and some worried slave owners. 
they take this ruling, which essentially says that, um, and historians are still debating this, but that essentially says that slavery is not allowed on like British home soil in England. They take that to mean that slavery is either officially outlawed everywhere in the British Empire or that it's going to be. So this is a topic of conversation in Dinah's life in 1772 before she gets her freedom. So what does she think about this? In 1773, Phyllis Wheatley gets a book of poems published, poems on various subjects, religious and moral, right? What does it mean to Dinah to know that there is another Black woman in the world who has managed to get a book of poetry published in London and that it's being sold in what's going to become the United States? What, what does that feel like for her? 1775, down in Virginia, John Murray, who's um, the, the last royal governor of Virginia, he issues a proclamation. He starts playing around with it in April of 1775. He makes it official in November of 1775. He basically says that if you are an indentured servant or if you are an enslaved person who is owned by a rebel, so the revolutionaries, right? He will make you free if you were willing and able to bear arms for the king. So now you've got all sorts of people who are hearing about this and they're gonna try to make their way to the British lines in Virginia. Now, there's lots of story around all of this. You could have a whole presentation on Dunmore's proclamation and Dunmore's Ethiopian regiment, which is the group of uh, people of African descent, which actually women are running to join as well. And Dunmore has to think about what to do with them. But essentially what happens is he doesn't get as many people as he wanted because illness sweeps through the camp. He does end up with um, with a relatively small group of people. They fight in one or two battles down in Virginia. And then when he flees Virginia because he sees that it's kind of a hopeless cause, he takes them with him. Many of them will later end up in Philadelphia. What else happens in 1775? The Pennsylvania Abolition Society is formed. Now, again, this is before Dinah gets her freedom. Now, their mission at the time that this organization is formed is not necessarily fighting against all enslavement. What they're trying to do is help free people who were unlawfully being held in bondage. So there are some interesting distinctions to make there. And they don't actually exist throughout the entirety of the revolutionary period. When the war breaks out, they go dark. And then they sort of reconvene after the war ends. But what is Dinah thinking and hearing about this? How is this influencing conversations that are taking place in and around her household, right? What does she hear the Logans saying about this? What does she hear members of the Logans community saying about this? There's some other fascinating stuff happening too, y'all. And I'm super excited to talk about this story. This is one of my favorites. In 1776, so we know the Declaration of Independence, July. What happens when a bunch of colonies decide that they're going to throw off the yoke of colonial or empirical rule? They have to come up with their own new governments, their own new systems of government. So basically, all of the colonies come states had to write new constitutions to determine how they were going to operate. Now, I could talk about Pennsylvania, but frankly, I think New Jersey is much more interesting because in New Jersey, they actually say, or maybe I should say they don't say what gender you need to be in order to vote. And they also don't say what race you need to be in order to vote. They say all inhabitants of this colony of full age who are worth 50 pounds proclamation money clear estate in the same and have resided within the county in which they claim to vote 12 months immediately preceding the election shall be entitled to vote. Now, a lot of folks were like, oh, this is a mistake. They definitely just like overlooked that. They're going to put the right details in later on. It's all going to get cleared up. 1790, they actually double down on this. That all free inhabitants of the state of full age who are worth 50 pounds proclamation money clear a state in the same and have resided within the county in which they claim a vote for 12 months immediately preceding the election shall be entitled to vote for all public officers, that in which he or she actually reside at the time of the election. 
And then again, 1797, and be it enacted that every voter shall openly and in full view deliver his or her ballot, which shall be a single written ticket containing the names of the person or persons for whom he or she votes. Imagine, imagine this, you were Dinah, you were living in Philadelphia, New Jersey is just across the river. And for about 31 years, there are women and free people of African descent who were able to vote. Imagine that. We know that they did vote. So here are two examples of poll lists that are from Dinah's lifetime. On the left-hand side, you can see 1802 from Salem County. On the right-hand side, you can see 1801 from Montgomery Township. You see that? All of those are women voters. You see that? That is a man of African descent who voted. Now, what we have not yet found are women of African descent who voted but we feel like they must exist. Now, the African-American men are not all marked as Negro. One of them, we had to do a lot of contextual research to understand that it was actually a person of African descent. So that might be what needs to be done for the women who were on this list, who are not clearly a part of specific families that we know are not people of African descent. Now, we had an exhibit called When Women Lost the Vote that was all about the story that was up in uh, 2020. We have since moved on to several other exhibits, which many of you may know, but that's the heartbreaking thing about having to move to the next exhibit is that we can't chase down all of the lingering questions we have. So what I'm gonna tell you is this, we've got a bunch of poll lists that are up on our website and we basically put the entire When Women Lost the Vote exhibit up online. If you wanna do this research and you would like to see if you can find a Black woman voter in New Jersey, please do. And please let us know if you find something. We will be jazzed. We will backstop it, double check it and everything. And if we truly have one, we will share that information with the world. We would be so excited. So that's something that Dinah would know about. What else would Dinah know about? Well, remember we mentioned that the British occupied Philadelphia. They were there from the fall of 1777 to the late spring, early summer of 1778. Well, what happens during that time is that a bunch of people of African descent actually flock to the city. So oftentimes the, the time that the British spend in Philadelphia is known as an occupation. But what if it was actually a liberation? For many enslaved people of African descent who were owned by revolutionaries, the British being in control of Philadelphia was a liberation, not an occupation. And in fact, I believe it's historian Gary Nash who says that when the British finally leave New York, if you're familiar with the, uh, the inspection role of Negroes, which basically is a document that tracks all of the people of African descent who left with the British out of New York City at the end of the war, Gary Nash, I believe it is, says that there's about 67 people of African descent who clearly say that they had previously been in Philadelphia before coming to New York with the British. One of those examples you can actually see on screen, a woman named Easter Clark, who is 35 years old and who is described as an ordinary wench. Interesting language. Um, she boards a ship on the 19th of November, 1783. But if you look at what would be on the next uh, page of her document, so imagine a book that is opening up on that next page, it says that she was formerly enslaved to Michael Clark of Philadelphia, and she departed the city in 1778. So she probably left the city when the British left at the end of that, that uh, occupation or liberation. So Dinah is probably hearing about or seeing or meeting these people as they're coming through the city as they're doing work for the British. Right? What is that like for her to think about all of these different kinds of life experiences? This is a part of Dinah's world. Also in 1778, George Washington gets passed a suggestion basically for how Rhode Island could possibly boost the number of soldiers that they have that are able to contribute to the Continental Army. The idea basically is that they will let 
people of African descent who are enslaved to get their freedom through their enlistment in the Rhode Island Regiment. In 1778, Rhode Island approves that plan. That means in 1781, while Dinah is still alive, as soldiers in the Continental Army are marching south towards Yorktown, Virginia, where the last major confrontation of the Revolutionary War is going to take place, she would either have heard about or she would herself physically have seen the Black and Native American men in the Rhode Island Regiment marching down Chestnut Street on their way to Yorktown. Imagine that. What would that have been like for her? What else is happening during this revolutionary moment? All of this is still during the period of the war. 1780, Pennsylvania passes the Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery. It says, if you are born after, what is it, March the 1st of 1780, you will get your freedom after laboring for 28 years for the person who would otherwise have been able to own you. However, if you were born before the passage of that act, you remain enslaved for the rest of your life. Now, at this point in time, Dinah has been free for, what, about three and a half, four years? What is it like to know that this stipulation has been put in place? What is the excitement? What is the frustration that exists in the communities that she's a part of? What is it like to know that everyone in her community who is enslaved is gonna have to be registered and then people have to sort of check on that every year and make sure that people's freedom is being defended or that their enslavement is being maintained per the stipulations of this law? What does that mean for her as a person who has relatively newly freed herself? Meanwhile, up in Massachusetts in 1781, a woman named Elizabeth Freeman and a man named Clock Walker both sue for their freedom. And within the next two to three years, each of them win. Essentially, that shuts down the practice of slavery in Massachusetts. Now, it's not a beautiful story, I will tell you that, because it's not like Massachusetts slave owners just up and free all of their enslaved people. Generally, what they do is they sell them south so that they can still get the economic benefit of their enslavement. And yet, what it does is it makes that practice financially untenable in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Again, Dinah is going to be hearing about this. Her community is going to be talking about it. When she thinks about Elizabeth Freeman, another Black woman who is in this world with her, is she looking at her like, you go, girl? Is she admiring her tenacity and her grit and her ability to fight for herself, despite what must have been terrifying circumstances? One would hope, but we don't know. And then what happens next after the war? Yeah, we've, we've moved pretty quickly. We are at after the war already. We're at 1787. Dinah lives until 1805. So we still have a little bit more time to go. But number one, Dinah is in Philadelphia at this really tenuous moment in time because people in the new states don't know what is about to happen next to their confederacy, to their union, to whatever it is that is holding them together. They're still operating underneath a document called the Articles of Confederation. But it seems like it's a document that is not serving all of the necessary purposes for maintaining order and unity and all sorts of things that are needed for all of these states that are kind of connected to one another. But do they want each to maintain their own separate fiefdoms where they are as powerful as possible? Do they want to cede some of their rights and some of their power in order to better work with other people? They're trying to figure that out. The war ends in 1783. The Constitutional Convention is not called until 1787. Right, And then it still takes time for that constitution to be ratified and then for the Bill of Rights to be passed. Meanwhile, riders are coming in and out of Philadelphia. If Dinah is in the center city area with the Logans, um, you know she's gonna be seeing all of these folks with their different accents coming from Virginia and Massachusetts and New York and all of these different people and having debates in the street and noises spilling out of taverns and coffee houses and all of these different places. And members of her community are having their own conversations and debates about this. Maybe they're hearing that the word slavery and the word slave do not appear anywhere in this document that is being drafted. What are they debating? What are they thinking about? 
Well, in a very pragmatic level, we know something very specific that they are doing. I love this story. I told you we were going to come back to the idea of graves. Members of Philadelphia's Black community are fighting against grave robbers who are trying to steal their family and friends. This is a transcription of a letter that was um, prepared by Independence National Historical Park, uh, but the letter is actually at the Library of Congress, and it's from Dr. William Shippen Jr. to, um, I believe, his son, yes, his son, Thomas Lee Shippen, from 1787. And if you just skip the first paragraph and go to the second, I'm going to read this out for you. We have and are still at a great loss for want of a subject for dissection and demonstration. Few die, and the Negroes have determined to watch all who were buried in the potter's field. The young men have been twice driven off by arms, once fired on, and two wounded with small shot. On Saturday night, with the assistance of six invalids with muskets, they beat off the Negroes and obtained a corpse. I lodged it in the theater. The resolute, impertinent Blacks broke open the house, stole the subject, and reburied it. This transaction was made known to the friends of the dead who joined the Negroes in great numbers on Sunday night and swore death and destruction to the faculty. So here is a doctor who is trying to procure bodies so that he can teach anatomy. And what he is trying to do is take the bodies of the quote unquote least of these, the people who were poor, the paupers, the formerly enslaved, the people of African descent, maybe Native Americans, maybe criminals who had been buried in one of the pauper's fields in Philadelphia. And Philly's Black community says no, and they stand up. Later in this same letter, he describes another attempt. And if we have time in the Q&A, I will absolutely share that with you. What else happens that Diana would be aware of and paying attention to? Well, there are yellow fever epidemics sweeping through the city. 1793 is the one that we are most aware of because it was the most devastating. What is it like for Dinah when for a span of, what is that, about three months, around 5,000 Philadelphians die? People are fleeing the city. They're trying to get to all of the green spaces, to their country homes, to their summer homes in places like Germantown, right? Now, there's a belief that people of African descent are immune to yellow fever. It's false, though and about 240 Black Philadelphians died, many of whom had been helping to take care of the people who were sick, who had been moving corpses out of the city and helping to bury them and performing all sorts of labor. And then they were accused, Philadelphia's Black community who had done so much to help during this epidemic, they were accused of profiteering by other citizens within the city of Philadelphia. The point, where Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, who at this point are um, essentially about to be leaders of two of Philadelphia's most important early Black churches, and which continue to be two of Philadelphia's most important Black churches, they have to write a pamphlet defending the Black community against those allegations. What does Dinah think when she hears about all of this? How scared is she when she sees how many of her community members are passing away because of this epidemic? What else happens after the war? Well, this is around the time that Absalom Jones and Richard Allen are each getting their freedom. Ona Judge leaves the president's house in 1796, never to be recaptured. Meanwhile, James Fortin, who was born free here in Philadelphia and who serves as a privateer during the course of the Revolutionary War, he actually takes control of an integrated sail loft in the city of Philadelphia on the Delaware River. And eventually the work that he does there makes him one of the wealthiest black men in Philadelphia. Black institutions are founded in the city during this time period. Diana gets to witness the birth of Bethel AME Church, or Mother Bethel as we know it today, the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, Zoar Methodist Episcopal, and others. There are schools that are being founded for African-American children, including one in Cyrus Bustle's home. The Free African Society is founded as a mutual aid and insurance society, and there's lots more taking place. So a lot of that is what is swirling around Dinah in her world from about 1730 to about 1805, or definitely to 1805. If you want to know more about what happens in the later period, sort of after her passing, you can definitely check out one of the exhibits that we've got online at the museum called Black Founders, the Fortin Family of Philadelphia. I think that that link will be dropped into the chat. 
You can also check out our Patriots of Color archive, which has information about both Black and Indigenous soldiers in the Continental Army, primarily from the New England region, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. It helps to give a sense of what's happening, sort of generally speaking, within the war. And you can check out the virtual tour that the museum has to offer. I think that link will be dropped into the chat as well. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I think we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A. Thank you, Adrian. This was amazing as always. Um, so I'm going to start with this first question. It's coming from Elise. Um, is there any surviving documentation of what other African Americans were saying about these events to get a better sense of what Dinah's thoughts could have been? Ooh, that is a good question. So I am going to speak for Stenton for a second and tell everybody, I mean, you will have heard this at the beginning, that their next program, I believe it is, is going to be in partnership with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania where they're gonna dig into some of the documents, some of the primary sources. So that's one space to look. But there actually are a surprising uh, number and range of different kinds of documents about people of African descent um, in the revolutionary era. Um, for example, there's a guy named, ooh, what is it, Lemuel Haynes, who publishes um, or prepares a sermon that uses the first lines of the Declaration of Independence as inspiration for talking about the importance of freedom for people of African descent during the revolutionary period. Many of Phyllis Wheatley's letters are published in uh, newspapers over the course of the revolutionary era. Um, she also writes an ode to George Washington and mails that to him, and that's actually accessible. Uh, you can find that online. Um, you can find reflections from people later on in life, sort of looking back at their earlier years. And one interesting, really interesting uh, source that people might not think about if they're not into the military side of things, is pension applications for African-American soldiers who fought in the Revolutionary War because they sort of relive their war experiences and sometimes reflect on what their lives were like at that point in time. But yeah, you can definitely find material out there. It's definitely not as voluminous as um, the materials about um, other folks, but there is material that exists. Thanks for that, Adrian. Um, we have another question. Um, someone shouting out their um, favorite um, revolutionary Black neighbor, possibly of Dinah, asking if you knew anything about Susanna Warder, who was um, enslaved by William Penn. I do not know anything about her, but now I want to. Wish I um did. Thanks for that, Shirley. Um, we also have a question from Kevin. Um, was the freeing of members of Dinah's family in the mid 1770s considered early? Ooh, that's an interesting question. So the Quakers um, had an, mm, the Quakers had a complicated relationship to uh, enslavement and freedom. And so as early as uh, the late 1600s, you already had people, I think, including, who is it, Daniel Pastorius? Um, who were lodging complaints against the practice of enslavement within the uh, Quaker community. And so you see manumission taking place, um, especially in Quaker heavy areas, relatively early on. The revolutionary era, the 1770s in particular, when there's all of this language around um, the natural rights of mankind and thinking about the practice of uh, chattel slave, well, political slavery, I'll say, um, from the British towards the Americans, has more and more people thinking about the contradictions between the freedom and liberty that they say they want versus what is being um, provided, offered, allowed uh, for people of African descent who were often in a situation of chattel enslavement. So you actually see kind of a flowering of, um, of manumission at this point in time. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is beautiful. Um, slavery gets doubled down on after the revolution. It expands across the United States. We all know the story it takes until the Civil War to actively get rid of it. But by 1800, I think every state north of Maryland has passed an act for the gradual abolition of slavery. And even in 1777, Vermont, which was not technically a part of the United States at that point in time, they actually abolished slavery in their state constitution. Pennsylvania still gets the claim it was first in the United States because Vermont was not a part of the United States at that point in time. But if there are any Vermonters on this call, I will now close my mouth. Thanks for that question, Kevin. Um, just a, a 
question of or point of clarification um, from Pamela was inquiring when exactly were Richard Allen and Absalom Jones freed and wasn't that before the revolution? Um, I believe one of them was able to purchase his freedom in 1793 and the other in 1794. Um, but someone else might be more knowledgeable than me on that and might be able to drop it into the chat. Thank you. We have a question from Elizabeth um, referring to Dinah's world circle. What documentation was is there for this existence? I haven't found such communities in New York um, with Black and indentured workers being in the same environments? Ah, so actually, I would allow y'all from Stenton to answer that question. I will say that there is a great treasure trove of primary source documents that's available on Stenton's website. If you go to stenton.org and then on the um, the navigation bar on the far right-hand side, there's a link for Dinah. And if you click that, it's just oodles of information. But Stenton, I will let you all answer that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say it's a, it's an ongoing project, but but uh, Adrian's ab absolutely right. Everything that we have found to date, we have archived on our website. Again, just go to that uh, www.stenton.org slash Dinah, and you can scroll through all, all of those documents yourself, and they're, they're sourced. And uh, yeah, so. Um, we actually have a um, message from Amy Cohen that says Richard Allen bought his freedom in 1780. So thank you Amy. for that. Thank you. Um, oh, this is a, a, a Stenton question. Um, so I'll I'll throw it to Dennis. Um, what if any other, well, who if any other people of color were living in the Logan household? That is also an ongoing project, <laughs> and uh, yeah, one of our one of our hopes is actually to undertake a project in the coming year where we can really create a full census of of at least what we can put together through the documentation of um, uh, the entire labor force at Stenton, both enslaved and free over the first three generations of the family. So um, we do know quite a bit, um, and uh, uh, but you know, it's incomplete uh, at this point. Um, and I don't have that uh, is readily accessible as we do some of the other documentation on our website. But I'd say, you know, hopefully within the next kind of year to two, we'll be able to assemble that and, and share that more publicly. And Dennis, you can probably say this better than I, but if the Logans are moving back and forth between Stenton and whatever their city house was down mm -hmm. in like Old City, Dinah's probably interacting with a lot of the Old City Black community as well, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, one of the more interesting things. So um, she's she's obviously in the household of, of William Logan and, and Hannah Logan, Hannah and, um, and uh, he has a townhouse and he spends a limited amount of time at, at Stenton. So she does spend uh, quite a bit of time at the townhouse. And we had a tall case clock that descended through the Logan family uh, that belonged to William Logan that uh, came back uh, from one of the descendants by bequest. Uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, so that's one of the things we we really like to think about is that's a sound that Dinah would have heard in her lifetime. Uh, and we've been able to keep that clock chiming so that visitors can can hear that as well. Um, and Madeline, thank you for asking this question, because I think sometimes we tell this story so much that it feels like uh, we in our minds, it's like everyone knows it. Um, but if we could just do a quick summary of the story around Dinah saving Stenton. I will leave that yeah. for you all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the, the story is is uh, interesting. And again, this is all, again, uh, part of what's documented on our website. So you can see some of the primary sources. I believe it's 1822 that um, Deborah Norris Logan first records this story. Uh, um and uh, at the time, um, uh, wh whoever is involved in the saving story is referred to, I, I believe, as an old domestic. Um, so Dinah doesn't actually become attached to the story until later in the 19th century. Um, but uh, um, but in the nutshell, the, the saving story goes something like this. Um, at, at the time, um, there weren't Logans at the house and Dinah was serving as a caretaker uh, and supposedly some uh, British soldiers come to the house and uh, they're going to uh, set the house ablaze. And so they go to the barn to find straw. And, you know, uh, we're left to imagine what Dinah's thinking about all this and what she can do to stop it. And uh, along comes a British officer and says, we're looking for deserters. Have you seen any? 
And Dinah says, oh, yes, the soldiers are hiding out in the barn. Quick, go arrest them. So, you know, due to Dinah's quick thinking, Stenton is saved. Um, <clears throat> that's that's the story in a nutshell, at least. Um, but uh, very much became a part of, you know, kind of Germantown community history for many years. And um, you'll see her, because of that, celebrate in, in murals today, um, you know, uh, in, in various places in Germantown. And, um, yeah. Um, we are actually at our time already, um, but before I pass the mic to Adrian to kind of close us out, I just wanted to say, piggybacking off Dennis uh, sharing the Dinah, uh, say house saving story that we invite all of you to join us um, April 20th from 2 to 4 p.m. at Stenton as we unveil the beautiful uh, Dinah, Pro Dinah Memorial uh, project um, that was designed by uh, Karen Olivier in community with our near neighbors. Um, we really appreciate you all again for coming out. We topped it out at 98 people um, tonight. So thank you all so much. And Adrian, thank you always for just your wealth of knowledge. It's like the well is, is, is there's no, we can't see the bottom. We never will. And we thank you for joining us, you know, even with you not feeling too well. And I'll hand this mic over to you. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you to everyone who showed up for this. Thank you uh, for Rachel dropping in. It looks like we were off by a decade, 1783 and 1784 for Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. So thank you for that correction. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any follow-up questions, you can feel free to send me an email at education at amrevmuseum.org. But of course, send all the actual Dinah questions over to Stenton. I hope you all have a great night and thank you again for attending.